Hello and welcome. My name is May Cannon. I'm the Executive Director of Churches for Middle East Peace. And this is our third as a part of an Easter Tide series, a call to spiritual activism from the Middle East. And today we have with us a very esteemed guest who we're happy to welcome Reverend Najla Kassab. So welcome, Najla. Thank you. And Thank for you. most, uh, we're, we're pleased to have you. It's good to see you again. And for most of us, this is sometime on a Tuesday. For me, it's early in the morning. For Najla, it's later in the afternoon, early evening. Um, but we want to come together before God as a part of the body of Christ and talk about some of the realities in the Middle East, but how the church can respond. So I'd love to open us with a word of prayer, and then I'll introduce Najla, and we'll have the opportunity uh, to hear from her. So this is a prayer that comes to us from um, two CMEP member organizations, uh, the United Church of Christ and the Disciples of Christ. And it's actually a prayer that they wrote and published um, late last year, a prayer for Lebanon. Uh, and so since Najla is joining us from Lebanon, I thought this would be a good way to begin. So please join me in prayer. Almighty God, today as we pray for Lebanon, we trust your wisdom, patience, and authority. We open your word and we hear your message again and again. While teaching in the temple, you were questioned and tested numbers of times by those trying to trap you, not to trust you. But you took the time to show them that your message was about life and about living. When we come to you, help us trust you and not doubt your wisdom and your plan. You know each of us, you know our questions and our needs. Grant us peace in this place where there is so much unrest and turmoil. As Lebanon faces economic uncertainty and hardship, encourage us and give us hope. Help us to be confident in the certainty of your sovereignty and authority over all. Guide us to stand firm and focus on the living word. Hear us, O Lord. Listen to our cry. Turn your ear to us and hear our prayer, for our hope is in you. Amen. 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 Yes. So joining us today is Reverend Najla Kassab, and she has several titles, so I'm going to read them to be sure to get them uh, just right and correct. Uh, Reverend Najla is the president of the World Communion of Reformed Churches and the director of the Christian Education Department for the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. She received her master's degree from Princeton University, a theological seminary in 1990. And in 1993, Reverend Najla received the first preaching license offered to a woman by the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. Mabruk, mabruk, mabruk. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then in March, 2017, she was only the second woman to become ordained as a minister by the same synod. She lives with her husband, Joseph, and three children in Beirut, and her work takes her frequently to Syria. So blessings to you, Reverend Najla Kassab. Ahlan, ahlan. Happy that you're here. Thank you very much. It's my joy to be here. And uh, this is not the first time we are together, uh, but it's so enriching to be together. And uh, uh, the, the secretary of my husband said uh, that it would be good to say I, my husband is also a pastor, Reverend Joseph Katsab. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> so a dynamic duo with the, yeah. the ministry that you. So, yes, we are, we are two pastors serving together in Lebanon and Syria. Yes. So, tell us a bit. Um, I thought this prayer was so appropriate for the things we're talking about this morning, you know, speaking of Lebanon specifically, but the broader Middle East. How are things in Lebanon? What does your life look like? What's, what are some of the realities affecting you there now? Yeah. Uh, really, uh, we are affected uh, with the coronavirus. Uh, the COVID has really uh, changed lots of things the same way it's happening around the world. Uh, you know, uh, we've been in a difficult situation in the Middle East for long, uh, but really the pain that we experienced during this time has a different flavor. You know, I've been in lockdown before, uh, and uh, I lived in war where many times we could not leave our homes. But with this uh, COVID-19, there is something, there's a stronger pain that we feel. 
uh, especially because we are uh, distant from our uh, uh, other friends, our neighbors, you know. As Middle Easterners, we live through relations with the others. And this is a time of living alone, which is not easy uh, for us. Uh, it's a time of shaping, uh, uh, raising difficult questions for us as individuals, for churches. It's a time of testing the families as well, uh, this lockdown. Uh, so these are difficult times. Uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, in lockdown still. Uh, since March 15, uh, we have been in lockdown and this has helped Lebanon uh, that we did not have a very high number of coronavirus cases. Uh, we have now around 710 uh, cases and we have uh, 24 deaths. And that's mainly because, you know, we're trying to contain uh, the virus. This week, we're starting to uh, open gradually. Uh, schools have been closing since March. Uh, we don't expect them to come back again, hopefully in May 15. Uh, but we are uh, really uh, doing testing. We haven't finished the number of testing that's supposed to be done. Uh, we have around 500 tests do, done daily, where we were supposed to do around 2,500 testing a day. Uh, we are in the process. Uh, our concern is that about the future, because we don't know exactly uh, uh, what are the next steps, whether we, there will be another wave of a coronavirus or not. And that gives us this uncertainty and these challenges about the future in that. I want to say we have another virus in, uh, in our situation, which is a very difficult economic crisis. Even when we are able to contain the virus and to overcome it, uh, we are faced uh, with a big problem economically, where we have around, uh, for example, 35% of the people, they receive only 50% of their salaries. Wow. Now, 17% of the Lebanese were not paid in the last months, no salary where many families, the lockdown, uh, have uh, made families who rely on working daily, they are moving to, to face hunger. And the situation in Lebanon is becoming more, the risk of uh, people being hungry is a real risk that even when we finish with the virus, when we go outside our homes, we will discover the big crisis, which already we started yesterday in, in Lebanon, and in several parts in Lebanon, the strikes were again on the streets because people were hungry, mm. are hungry, and they don't know about the future. So this is really the big crisis that we are facing. Uh, a woman said, is it difficult, is it more difficult to die of hunger or of coronavirus? Wow. She even, she even uh, another woman said, I prefer to have food rather than hygiene fits. Mm. So it's, it's a very difficult situation. And already we had our uh, challenges before uh, with the war in the Middle East, uh, what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in Syria. Uh, so we are surrounded, but this is probably one of the most difficult uh, economic crises that the country is facing. And Reverend Najla, can you help us understand, um, you know, I work in the Middle East and study it and consider myself fairly well informed, but I don't really understand some of the core issues of the economic crisis. I mean, in, in February, I was at a meeting in New York City and I met a Lebanese businessman who travels back and forth. Um, between Be or did at least travel back and forth between Beirut and New York. And he said to me something about bank accounts being closed and not having access to money, which seemed like, yes, there's extreme poverty. And I mean, you shared these statistics, 17% not getting paid in the last month, but yeah. the crisis seems to be systemic and affecting even the wealthy. Uh, yes. what's, what's that all about? Can you help us understand that? Yes, since October, uh, if you were following the news, uh, Lebanon had massive rallies and protests on the street done by the young people against corruption since October 17. 
And it's mainly, I think, what led us to the, where we are uh, is corruption. Mm -hmm. And the silence against corruption, you know, because nobody wanted to speak up. Since October, uh, what some people would like to call the revolution, the young people, uh, both Christian, Muslims, men, women, were on the streets just saying that, you know, challenging the systems, challenging the financial system. And at that time, we felt like uh, this is a sign of hope mm. of people challenging uh, uh, situations of corruption in the Middle East. Uh, but this, this uh, you know, uh, protest was interrupted by the coronavirus, where everybody had to be home uh, for the sake of our safety, and it was interrupted. But uh, we have a debt today as a country, nine, around nine, $91 million, which is one of the biggest numbers, you know, of debts that a country has. Uh, the amount of importing, you know, with the amount of the things that we ex uh, import is much larger than what we export. So there is imbalance economically. And we, uh, lots of the money was sent outside uh, uh, the Lebanon. And this is why we have a crisis of dollars. You cannot hear withdraw dollars from banks. So it's, it's uh, many factors. And we, we, the people did not know that, the, that it was this drastic till the numbers started to appear to everyone. So uh, now we cannot withdraw uh, money from the banks, especially dollars. Okay. Uh, the dollar used to be to equal 1,500 Lebanese pound. Now a dollar equals 4,000 Lebanese pounds, which means you know, uh, the value uh, of the currency dropped ver down very fast. Salaries probably uh, are half their value now. Everything is becoming expensive because we uh, import many things. So it's a cycle of, of wrong decisions. And we as Lebanese still trying to understand as well uh, how we reached here this fast uh, with the debt accumulating during these years. And uh, it all burst at one time. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the protests that were in the fall before the coronavirus and then people being back out on the streets now because they're hungry or, or because yes. of poverty, yes. do you yes. think it's the same people? Is it the same type of protest when you talked about kind of the revolution in the yes. fall? Yes, it is, it is really the same, that the, the people who are hungry. Yesterday, uh, a person on the, uh, on the TV said that his son did not eat for five days. Hmm. And these are real stories. I, I receive calls from people who said, we don't have money to finish uh, the basic needs for food. You know? uh, for example, the Senate has a ministry of uh, education, schools, uh, where in Lebanon, around 70% of the Lebanese go to private schools. And these the private schools who have very good uh, educational standards, you know, for example, we've been closed for two months. The parents could not pay the salaries, the fees, and we don't have cash to pay the salaries of the teachers. So far, we are paying 50% of salaries just to keep people, help teachers to have the basic uh, food uh, for them. Uh, this is a crisis that the church is facing. How can we be the church? How can we feel with the uh, teachers where we, in the coming three months, they will be receiving half a salary and then we will not have cash in the schools. So it's a cycle of uh, how the church can remain to, be, to feel with the human needs. And at the same time, if the schools are closed, the parents will not pay. So uh, it's a crisis of keeping the human dignity, the basic dignity of food, you know, uh, at this time. Right. One of the people um, who's joining us just mentioned that this crisis affecting schools is happening throughout the Holy Land, throughout the Middle East, yes. where schools are being affected. For and sure. And this is our main ministry. Uh, I always say this is, uh, uh, these schools are very important. I always call them the better pulpit. Mm -hmm. where we share the love of Christ with everyone, Muslim, Christian, unconditionally, shaping them, sharing the love of Christ, 
in a special way. So these are very, these are their church really outside the walls of the regular church to yeah. us. Yes. And so as you're talking to us about these material needs, one of the things we were talking about um, are some of the spiritual challenges or the spiritual opportunities. What does this look like for the church as the church seeks to respond, you know, seeing protests and uh, more physical needs than can be met, uh, you know, with your yeah. immediate resources? Yes. You know, uh, as, as people who work in the church, we discover calling people to pray only is not enough. Mm -hmm. Is no more enough. Mm -hmm. When people call us and, you know, uh, they, they, uh, they are hungry, uh, we cannot just tell them, let's pray. Mm -hmm. We have to do something about it. And May, I want to share something that happened yesterday in our church, where the pastors in Lebanon of our church decided that they are going to start a fund for the poor where they gave half of their salaries as a starting for that fund. Hmm. And I want to say uh, that uh, yesterday this was a, 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 a decision that gave us a strength that pastors are ready to give up. You know, they're giving out of their need. They're not giving because they have uh, a lot. Yes. But they are ready to say, to have a statement of feeling with the poor and the hungry and sharing what they have, the little they have with these people. We hope next week that the, the pastors in Syria will do the same. Hmm. And it's because people, people's eyes are on the church. Where's the church when people are hungry? And this is a big responsibility for all of us. But this action gave us a sign of hope that you know, when you have faithful servants, we can all join hands. When you have faithful brothers and sisters around the world, we can do things together. And I believe we always survive the crisis because of this faith that God could use us at this difficult time. So we're trying to do as much as we can. Uh, and, and this is why uh, we, we started a new NGO uh, in our church, uh, after the Syrian war, we discovered the need of helping uh, people. It's called CPS, which is called Compassion Protestant Society. It's the diaconal arm of the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. And uh, really, it started uh, in 2018. And now we're discovering how important that, that body is, where we have now an urgent project that we already started of feeding 500 families for four months, giving them a package of food around $100, you know, and we have uh, a cost of $200,000 that would help 500 families to continue for the coming four months. Uh, these families, you know, we just want to secure basic food for them. And uh, we're happy that the, uh, Compassion Protestant Society is starting to reach out and to help around people around us, not only, you know, uh, the Protestants, as much as we can with the limited resources that we have. Uh, it, is, it is because of the economic crisis, this has become a pressing need. And I believe uh, this NGO, this Compassion Protestant Society, will help us to express our faith in a real practical way. And one of the things we will do at Churches for Middle East Peace, I can see that um, we'll be posting a link to that both in the chat and in uh, for other people who watch this conversation later, the Compassion Protestant Society. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So we and and this is, uh, we, learned, we learned this through the pain of uh, that's happening in, in Syria and now in Lebanon, uh, that to preserve the dignity of the people is the gospel, is, the gospel. Is, to, is to be able to say, uh, I love you and I'm ready to share my food with you. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I never personally imagined that we will reach to this extent in Lebanon, but here we are, the coronavirus added to that, and I'm sure the same situation in Israel, Palestine, and it is the people who uh, 
look for the church to, to be really the sign of hope. And uh, I know here in Lebanon, the young people are challenging the church as well to see how, how we can help. And not only uh, the Protestant church, but the other churches around. It's time that we express our love in practical steps hmm. so that justice is lived among the people. Hmm. That is a beautiful word. Um, can you tell us, Reverend Najla, uh, how is the church in Syria? I mean, we've been following, of course, the church over the last several years and many of the realities affecting all Syrians and the displacement. But how are our brothers and sisters there? You know, uh, the situation of the church in Syria is similar in some way, uh, like Lebanon. Uh, we, we are worshiping virtually uh, on, on media. Uh, people are in lockdown. Uh, they cannot go outside. Uh, I, we don't know the exact numbers, you know. I don't know the exact numbers of the coronavirus. Uh, we don't hear much of, about uh, fighting. And, and that's really, uh, in some way, uh, it's b because the world is worried with the coronavirus. And in some way, that's risky because I'm afraid that with the coronavirus, people will forget the other injustice that's happening around the world. I believe this is the most difficult part about uh, how the coronavirus has affected us because I know it's a priority, but I'm afraid that we will end up uh, forgetting the suffering that, and the war situation uh, that other people are going through. Uh, in the Middle East. Uh, I know that United Nations called for to stop the fighting around the world and to focus on the coronavirus. But I'm afraid that when we don't hear anything, this doesn't mean that nothing is happening. Yes. It's the media does not care as much about that. And there is a risk in that, uh, in what's happening. It, it uh, adds more in, injustice. As our World Communion of Reformed Churches boasted lately, the coronavirus is an amplifier of existing inequalities, yes. injustices, and insecurities. So uh, it, it showed also, you know, uh, probably one of the injustices is that the story is not on the front line anymore. We don't know what's happening. And at the same time, uh, the coronavirus showed how uh, there are people who are provided with excellent medical services and there are people who cannot afford to have any uh, good uh, medical services or even don't have the place to have distancing in that. So injustices are still there and uh, people are fragile. Uh, we're discovering that. So it's, it's, uh, I'm afraid about all the causes of injustice that we have been uh, working towards will be silenced at this time. Uh, and uh, probably injustice will continue in a stronger uh, way. That's one of the things we've been talking about at CMEP as well, just what you articulated so clearly that the realities of oppression or injustice or poverty, it's not that they stopped existing, they're actually exacerbated mm -hmm. by these realities, but getting less attention. Yes. And so the work of responding for Middle East peace. We, we echoed the call of the Vatican and the United Nations in calling for a global ceasefire, but yes. believe our advocacy work is so much more critical as we yes. engage right now because of just what you um, stated. And in that regard, what would be your encouragement to people in terms of, um, I know you said praying is not enough, but we will pray and, and I know you want us to. So how can we pray for you and how can we respond when we think about spiritual activism in light of these realities? Uh, what would your encouragement to us be? Yes, you know, for sure we can, the, the virus could not stop us from praying and could not stop us from being the body of Christ around the world. And that's a blessing that uh, joining now for this, uh, you know, webinar uh, gives us strength as a community here. Hearing the story of people, you know, uh, making sure, you know, that uh, uh, we, we, information is very important. And probably now, because we are all in some way going through the same crisis, mm. this never happened before. Uh, I know in the Middle East, we've been in war situation for long, but now there is a similar pain around the world. 
where people can understand what it is to be locked in a, in a room and uh, to be disconnected. Probably in some countries, people, you know, the governments can support uh, wealthy countries, they can uh, help. Uh, but in our context, we have to stand alone. Our country cannot help us because they are already in, in economic situations. So uh, I think joining together on keeping the story alive, hmm. sharing the stories of the people who are suffering. And sometimes, you know, it takes us uh, to uh, rescue one uh, fish <laughs> and that gives us confidence as a church, you know. I know we cannot solve all the problems, but I like the story of a person who's holding, who's on the shore where there's a flood of fish, you know, coming towards him. And he was carrying one fish and throwing it back into the ocean. And one fish, and the, uh, his friend told him, uh, why are you doing this? It's nonsense. Don't you see the amount of fish that are outside? He said, I am rescuing this fish. Mm. And I believe all of us in our ministry, if we look at the general, we feel uh, discouraged. But we could rescue one family. We could rescue one fish. We can focus, you know, and probably as a church, we're learning that so that we don't get discouraged. The needs are many, but to start probably with twinning with one family who has economic problem. Mm. To send money that you make sure when you have a lot on your plate that you can share uh, with one family in the Middle East, you know. Small steps, but these steps will encourage us uh, as, uh, as believers, to trust that faith is alive. It's much more than talking. It's sharing. And probably this coronavirus taught us how valuable it is to share life with people, with mm. others, with individuals, and probably sharing, uh, uh, writing to people, uh, uh, praying with them. Uh, one of my ministry during uh, this time was calling people who I know I, they are alone, you know, mm -hmm. and, and as churches, we can do the support uh, through that, uh, getting in touch with people who are struggling, uh, sending, you know, uh, sharing our money, sharing our prayers. And I like the prayer that you shared with me, meant a lot for me uh, with the Lebanese, you know, and it is, it is, not getting tired and this is what i we could always get involved in issues but we end up uh, with fatigue christian fatigue i think to keep the spirit of feeling the pain uh, of other people in the middle east hmm. is a an empowering activity because some people could be motivated for one week and then forget the pain but to keep on and to feel like I will keep working till justice is lived mm. is, is a strong statement. And you know, God gives us strength. I always, uh, I follow up what C CMAP is doing and I know how persistent you are. You mean it. And I believe as Christians, we are called to mean uh, what we are doing. Today, when the, the decision came for the pastors giving half of their salaries, to me, it's not the money. It's they mean what they preach about on Sunday. Yes. And, and I think we are all challenged in this way every day. Uh, and, you know, getting connected, sharing the stories, get on the website, read about our stories, read about what uh, CPS, Christian Compassion Protestant Society is doing, uh, getting involved, praying for, uh, for people. Uh, all will help us to feel like we are not helpless. Hmm. We are together. And together we can make a difference. Uh, together we can see what God wants from us as a church today. Uh, this is a time of shaping uh, where we are shaped, all of us around the world, uh, where we start to value what we have differently. Uh, and uh, this is a time that we can share things together. Hmm. Uh, I know uh, one of a uh, Lebanese theologian said, do not worry about a church that has no money. 
or is facing struggle, struggle, but worry about a church that has no hope. Hmm. And I believe this relation gives us hope, all of us, whether churches in the Middle East or churches in the US are around the world, to keep the hope, to say that there will be a better tomorrow. And this is where the strength, you know, not to get tired on the way with what's happening. Uh, hope is, is, you know, pro- this meeting together gives us hope today and the trust uh, that the church around the world cares and the church, we believe that God will use us for a better tomorrow. I know every one of us will, not, will come out not the same from this crisis. And this time of uh, learning together what it means to love people unconditionally, to share the pain and to be able to, uh, with sometimes small amount of money gives hope to people that the church did not forget them, but uh, it is alive. Reverend Najla, your words are such an encouragement to me personally, as you talk about not giving up. And, you know, one of the things I've been saying a lot this year um, and in the past is that despair is a luxury of the privileged. And so we want to hold on to hope. Um, So thank you so much for being with us. Would you be willing to close us in prayer and with a benediction? Sure. I will pray in English and then I will close with a benediction in Arabic. Ah, Shukran. Almighty and gracious God, we trust that you are with us. We trust that you are a risen Lord who gave us hope. We know, Lord, that the final word is not for death, but for resurrection. You know, Lord, the pain that the people around the world and the people in the Middle East are facing. And we know that you have experienced pain yourself and you're the one who who will help us to look for a better future with the eyes of hope. We are hopeful because you are with us. I thank you for our brothers and sisters around the world uh, where we are strengthened by each other and we together form the body of Christ, a communion of people who believe in justice and who believe that our Lord can make a difference. Use us, Lord, for all that glorifies you. Amen. Amen. Wanaamat Rabbina Yasu al Masih, wa mahabatullahi al Ab, wa sharikat al Ruh al Qudus, takun ma'ana, wa tadun fina, min al An, wa ila al Abad. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank Reverend Majla. Good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, May. God bless you.